apply the blood, how to apply the blood in your life, how to, uh, you know, how to appropriate that. Take that which God has given us. He has given us the blood of Christ and He was the final sacrifice we know. And because of His blood, we are set free. And we were looking last week at some of the places in the Bible where the sacrifices of blood was made and all the places where the blood has purified us, cleansed us and so on. And we're going to go into redemption and, uh, and, and all the stuff that the blood does. But this morning I just want to speak to you a little bit about uh, how to apply the blood. I remember when I was a young boy, my, uh, we always said when we went into services and demons started manifesting and stuff, then my parents always said, you must plead, plead the blood of Jesus over you. Just plead the blood of Jesus over you. You must plead the blood of Jesus over you. As I good gebeur, play the blood of Jesus for you. And I said, those are skinners, we're going to die. We're going to die. Oh, yeah, I play the blood of Jesus for you. Play the blood of Jesus for you. The Bible says that we need to apply the blood. So, how do you apply the blood? So, first of all, um, the blood is applied by our testimony and our confession, by the words that we speak. You know, in, in, the, in, in, in the church world and as Christians, there's so much power in the tongue. And that by speaking things, in the Old Testament you had to physically bring sacrifices, you had to physically do all kinds of stuff. But in the New Testament we have the words of our mouths, which are so powerful. God has brought everything into our confession. And what we speak and what we say, that is where your life goes. That is where uh, things in your life, uh, that, that what, that's what makes your life go forward or stay stagnant or or being destroyed in the words that you say. So Revelation 12 verse 11 says, Revelation 12 verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the words of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So the Bible says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the words of their testimony. That's how you overcome the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb, and the words of your testimony. Your, first of all, your testimony of Christ Jesus. And we're going to look at some uh, stuff like uh, salva uh, salvation, redemption, uh, righteousness, and, and all the things that God has done in us through the blood. And we're going to declare those things over ourselves because that is how you appropriate it, how you apply it. So, First of all, the Bible says that, uh, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So you see the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, it goes together. You must speak the blood. That's why my parents always said, plead the blood, speak the blood. You know, when the enemy comes against you, say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. I told you when I was in Zambia, we had a crusade and we were in the school. And there were some, a lot of young people, so we went into the bush, we drove about, I think, like 25 or 30 kilometers into the bush from the main town. And then uh, we came to this whole uh, school, uh, village, we had to walk around there and so on. And the night we had, the, 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 we had a crusade and we started singing. And as we were singing, the young people were there on the, on the grass and everything, and we started singing. And as we sang, uh, uh, I, we sang that song, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. You know, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. And we will give God all of our praise. And we started singing the song. And as I sang the song, and every time I said, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Those children on the field started manifesting. The demons started manifesting in them. That was so amazing to me. And that's where I, for the first time I saw how the blood of Jesus and speaking the blood of Jesus, how it manifested and caused demons to manifest. You know, and what I saw in Africa, I, I said to the leaders, you know, that... that Demons are sometimes, we think they are so powerful, they so, but when you're in Africa and places like that, they're actually very um, common, they're very simple, they, they kind of, they respond quickly to the Word of God. Yeah, they cultivate it, you know, they've got manners, they know how to act, they know how to talk, they know how to do their thing, you know, that's why you don't always see them, they know how to keep themselves uh, at bay. But in Africa, they just manifest. 
You know, they just come out. They just respond. When you start speaking about Jesus and you speak the blood of Jesus, they just respond. Because that is a very high spiritual culture. And those people are so close, especially in those villages, because they still have a, uh, some goma or someone there that kind of works all their doctoral stuff and fix them and so on, you know, and, and so on. So when we sang that song, Satan, the blood of Jesus, is against you then I started manifesting and eventually every and then I just started singing that song Satan the blood and I just kept on going and every time I sing it the demons manifest and the children start falling on the ground and they were rolling around on the ground and, and our Bible school students went in and they started praying for them and, and laying hands and they deliverance and stuff uh, I didn't even really believe in it that much. I believe it's a mind thing. People need to change their thoughts and change their minds. The Bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I believe in those things. But I never really saw it. And that day when we were standing there we were preaching and, and, and singing yeah, and, and you just saw it. And I, and I could see the immediate response of the enemy to the blood of Jesus. You know, that was so powerful for me. And eventually, um, just to finish the story, we, we, we ended the service by, uh, by 10 o'clock or so. And the guys kept on uh, ministering to those children, casting out demons, even till late in, in the night. They were casting out demons on the, on the field, out of those children. And how the, uh, it was so powerful, you know. And so I want to tell you that there's truth and there's power in the blood of Jesus. So the Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And this is speaking in Revelations. It's actually talking after everything. And what's going to happen. And, he's, and, and this is the uh, people that came into heaven and that are saved. And, says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So there's power in your testimony. There's power in declar declaring the word of the Lord. There is power in speaking the word over things. And as believers, we need to realize if we speak the Word of God, the Word of God in our mouth is just as powerful as the Word of God in His own mouth. And if you can speak the Word and get to know the Word, and you can speak it, you will overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the Word of your testimony. Amen. Hebrews 3 verse 1. He says, Hebrews 3 verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. The Bible says, consider the apostle and high priest. Now, in the old times, the, the high priests were also called apostles. You know, so, he says, consider the high priest and apostle of our confession, Jesus Christ. So, we must confess Jesus Christ. And that he is the high priest. You know, I, I, I went and I, I had a look at this scripture. And it's there for holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And that caught my attention. I started thinking, Lord, but why partakers of the heavenly calling? And I started looking in the day's Bible. And I started looking around and so on. And I just want to share with you a little bit. So the Bible says, partakers of the heavenly calling. You know, that so many times we think that our own calling, our calling is just for the earth. We see, I believe that we have a calling for the earth. And I believe in the calling of the church for the earth. Because Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, lay your hands on the sick, cast out demons. Uh, you know, and, and that we should do these things. We must fulfill the great commission. You know, and I believe in our earthly calling. And that's what we are called for when we come into the, into the church and become children of God. We step into our call and we must start fulfilling the great commission. But then he talks here about the heavenly calling. You know, and I went and I read about that. And there's a lot of scriptures around it. But what he talks about mainly is that our calling after we've been on the earth and, and, and adding to the previous one, uh, overcoming by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, those ones are going to step into the heavenly calling. You see, we have a heavenly calling as well, not just an earthly calling. And, and, and what the Dakes explains is that after our earthly calling, we will be uh, called, we will get to heaven. I, I heard Kenneth Hagen once said that um, he died and he went to heaven. And when he got to heaven, it was like everyone that died uh, stepped into a school again. You know, it was like a school. You came in at grade one and you started grade one, grade two. We've got standard one, standard two. Today it's just grade three and grade four, you know. 
So we, uh, you go to school again where God starts teaching you the things that you have not learned on the earth. He starts teaching you before you can come into the throne and into the presence of God. Because He's our only God and he, where God is, they can, no sin can step. You know, but the main thing that Kenneth Hagin was telling about, he said that you're going to school again where you are taught. You see, because I believe that you are being prepared for your heavenly calling. And then with God, we are going to rule the universe. Everything out there, everything that we don't know about, we are going to be uh, co-heirs and we're going to rule with Christ. So the Bible says here, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Now, I looked at the word confession, and um, in another translation, it also uses the word profession. Now, profession is what you do... Uh, it's actually um, professing sometimes, uh, the one meaning of it is to say something or declare something that you're not, that you, you're really not. You know, maybe saying, uh, you know, I'm a good uh, truck driver, like I was a driver, you know, uh, uh, trucks. So I'm a good truck driver, but meantime you're not that good, but you say that you're good, you know. Uh, and, and, and so that's one of the things of profession is to, uh, or to profess is to say something that you not, uh, really are not, you know. So, um, and I think a lot of that is in the church today. We are Christians. We profess ourselves as Christians. We say we are Christians. But in the real sense of it, we're actually not, you know. And we need to come to that place where we become what we say we are, you know. And I looked at this word, and it comes to, um, okay, a profession is actually, when they talk about a profession, it also comes to the word a professional, you know, where you are professional in what you do. A lot of people will rely on your professionalism or professionality, I don't know. You know, if you, uh, if a lot of people will rely on that for building, maybe, that they want to build. They rely on your profession and your professionalism, being professional at what you do, that you will build it so it will be up to standard. You know, and, and, and I think so many times um, uh, when we have a profession, and this just spoke to me in the sense of being professional. You know, so many times as Christians, we... we, we we Christians, but we don't really know everything. We don't really um, understand everything. But we go on and we do whatever we do, you know. And we uh, go out and we preach the gospel, which is good because that's where you start, and you should do that. But you know, all of us should also have this um, uh, the striving for coming into the fullness of what Christ has for us. You know, striving for knowing the Word. The Bible says, "Study to show yourself approved." A workman of God to rightfully divide the word of truth. In other words, to kind of become professional in the things of God. To be able to speak the word, like Paul says, uh, in season and out of season. To be able to preach, to give a, 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 a testimony and, and to speak, you know, about what you believe. So people can believe it and see it. So I believe that as believers, you know, we, we, we want to be professional in everything that we do in the world. But how professional are we in the things of God? You know, and when it comes to professional in the things of God, it's not about, um, it's about knowing the Word. It's about uh, rightfully dividing the Word. It's about speaking the Word. But also, it's the character. You know, because uh, when I read this about the profession and professionals, Usually they have a very strict code of conduct that they live by because everyone must look up to them like a doctor for instance. They must carry themselves well, they must speak well, they must be, uh, they must have, they must be well mannered. So when they come to a place then they will say, oh doctor, this and that, and then he carries himself well. You know, so there's a, there's a way that you carry yourself professionally if you're a professional. You understand that? <laughs> And as Christians, sometimes we are so unprofessional, you know. And I mean, there's a there's place for being happy-go-lucky. There's place for just being yourself. There's place for being who God has called you to be. But eventually, you will grow. And that professionalism is not in being 
having a, a great stature and speaking very highly or whatever like that, but it's being professional in your conduct. And that conduct, Galatians 5, having the fruit of the Spirit, you know, walking in the fruits of the Spirit where you have patience and kindness and goodness and self-control and, and all these fruits of the Spirit are emanating from your life. And people will see it. When they come into your presence, they will experience the fruits of the Spirit. A person that is calm under pressure. A person that loves. A person that, that cares. A person that, you see, and that's a higher level of professionalism. Because when you look at these guys, that's what they actually try and get. But we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the exact reputation of Christ inside of us. We carry the presence of God inside of us. Do you know that? You carry the very nature of God inside of you. And if you will draw closer to that nature, you will become like Him in every area of your life. That's why when you confess Him, when you speak Him, when you declare the Word of God over your life, when you speak the Word, when you read the Word, you are professing it. You are confessing it. You are speaking it. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. And as you hear the word, you become the word. You become like the word. You start speaking the word as the word says it. I've been reading in the old King James from the dates. I was too lazy to get the NIV and read from there. So I just read this old, the thus and the thou's and the, you know, in, in the old King James. But when you read it, you actually hear this biblical kind of a language. You know, and I always remember the Americans when they preach, they quote the scriptures like that. And I always told our leaders as well, try and read the NIV and read the New King James and, and stuff like that. Read Bibles like that so that you have the scripture kind of in the context that it's written. So many, many times we take all these new written standards and stuff. And if someone reads me the scripture, then I think, what scripture is that? I can't even recognize it. But once I read it, in the NIV or I read it, oh yes, it's that one, you know. So that there's something about reading the older Bibles, you know, and to, to have that scripture ready like that, because in it there's so much, listen to the scripture, just listen, uh, I mean, um, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession in Christ Jesus. Now, just reading confession in Christ Jesus, now I'm preaching a whole sermon just on confession. There's so much about the words that the Bible used. And if you take those words, you go and look in the Greek and you look in the Hebrew, and you take those words and you break them apart. There's so much in that word. You know, um, it's so powerful. So, what I'm saying is, so profession is agreeing to what God says. When you uh, confess, you agree to what God says. That is what confession is. I said faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. So you speak the word, you're confessing the word, you are agreeing with what God says because you speak the word as if you, be you believe that word and you speak it because you believe it and that it becomes your confession. That becomes what you believe. That becomes what you say. Whenever things come against you, when, it, when things are wrong, you say, Father, your word says, when the enemy comes against me like a flood, you raise up a standard against him. You know, and then God comes and he, you confess what the word says. When the enemy comes against me like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. You know, in that scripture you can go both ways. When the enemy comes against me like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him, a wall, something to hinder him. Or you can read it, when the enemy comes against me like a flood, God will overpower him. You know, God will uh, defeat him, you know, like a flood. You know, so there's so much in the word. So what I want to say is that, at the end of the day, when you start confessing the word, you are agreeing with God. You say, Lord, your word says, when the enemy comes against me like a flood, you will raise up a standard against him. So, Father, right now, I thank you by faith that you are raising up a standard against the enemy. So, you're using that word. You're agreeing with that word. Right now, Father, you are raising up a standard against him. Your word says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. So, if he comes... Those gates will not prevail against me. You will raise up a standard against him and you will push him back. Amen?
so it's so powerful when you when you start saying that. So uh, then then that word profession can also mean terms or confession can mean terms of sur of surrender. And this talks about covenant. It's the terms of surrender when two people go against one another uh, uh, or come. Uh, there's so many type places in the Bible where they made treaties. There was a, a, a preacher, I can't remember his name now, uh, that uh, David Livingston, I think it was Livingston, when he went into Africa, everywhere he got to he, 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 African native, uh, tribes and stuff, he made covenants with the kings. And the covenant is usually a blood covenant where they cut their arm and let the blood flow, and they mix the blood, and they profess or they confess, they make a confession and say, because we are in a covenant, whatever is yours is mine. If someone attacks you, it's as if they attack me. We become one in that. It's like a marriage where it's a covenant. So it speaks of covenant. And then when David Livingston went through uh, the Africa, and as he went on, every time he got to a tribe or someone that wanted to come against him, he just lifted up his arm. And they saw all the cuts that has been healed. But they saw all the cuts and they knew that this man is in covenant with so many other tribes and so many other men. So if we come against him, it's as if we are coming against the, those tribes. And if we kill this man, then all those tribes will back him up. And they will come and kill us. So they stood back and they rather made a covenant with him as well. And so he carried on. You know, it's so powerful when you see that. So, so when he talks about... Um, it's, it's, it's the, uh, uh, the terms of surrender. That terms of the surrender talks about covenant. Okay, we're not going to fight. Let's become friends and let's make a covenant. You know, it's the terms of surrender. But in these terms, you must never attack me. And I will never attack you. Um, if, some, if I owe someone something, then you have to come and help me to pay that. If you owe someone something, I will come and help you to pay that. So it's a covenant. Now, so there's terms of surrender. So your confession can be terms of surrender. When you come to the Lord, you say, Father, my life I remember as a young man standing on the beach, knowing my family was going through so many things, so many things has happened. I stood on the beach and I said, Father, this is my, no, I didn't say it that way, but these were kind of my terms. I said, Lord, I will give my life to you. If you will take my life, because I will never be a success in this life if it's not for you. If I cannot give my life to you, I don't know where I'll end. So today I'm standing on this beach, there in Strand, and I give you my life. And I will go to Rayma, I will go to the Bible school, and I'm going to study your word. But then take my life and make something of it. Don't let me go down the drain like my family or whatever, you know. And I gave my life to the Lord. Those were my terms of surrender. And God took me at my word. And God gave me His Son. He said, I will give you my Son. His blood will cover you. I will cleanse you. I will restore you. I will turn you into a great nation. Your latter will be greater than the former. God's always got more than what you can give. You have one or two things that you ask of Him. But He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. He can exceed all your expectations. Amen. I must move on. You guys are holding me up. I just want to read you a profession. A profession is a disciplined group of individuals who adhere to ethical standards and who hold themselves out as and are accepted by the public as possessing special knowledge and skills in a widely recognized body of learning derived from research, education and training at a high level and who are uh, prepared to apply this knowledge and exercise these skills in the interest of others as a professional. And the problem I took the earlier is that this way it's just like the body of Christ. We should be people that profess something that we are, not say something that we're not. We must speak what we, we must be what we say. And I believe as believers we must become.
professional in the things of God. I know it's a wrong word maybe to use, but if you understand what I'm saying, you know, we need to become good. Matthew 12, verse 37. By your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The Bible says that by your words you will be justified. In other words, what you say will justify you. Justification means to set you free. is to make you in right standing. It's to make you righteous. Bring you in right standing. Justification is to set you free. Then, uh, so... Um, he says, the words, uh, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Condemned means uh, put under, means uh, put in prison. Uh, the, the final words, uh, final hammer will fall on you, you know. It's like a judgment against you. Judgment will come on you, but by your words, the Bible says. By your words. So it's your words that justifies you, and it's your words that condemns you. So therefore, we need to be careful what we say. We need to be careful what we confess. And we are talking about your confession. And your confession is how you apply the blood. You know, when, when Moses and them were standing in front of their houses, they had to apply that blood. And how they did it, they caught all the blood. I spoke to you last week about that. They caught the blood in the basin or a little bucket or something. And then they took the hyssop branch. And that hisa branch is something small, something simple. And they put it in the blood and then they applied it to the doorpost. And applying the blood of Jesus is by speaking, saying it. Amen. Um, the Bible says in James 3 verse 4, it says, Or take ships as an example, although they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot wants to go. So your tongue steers your life. The Bible says it's like a ship. Look at the ship. Although it's driven by strong winds. The winds can push it this way. And the winds can push it that way. But it's controlled by a small rudder. By the pilot. And he steers it where he wants it to go. That's amazing. You know, I've been looking at these ships here in Blauberg. That lies there. These big container chips you know that thing is so big and imagine that the wind pushes it from the side and it pushes it that way and the captain just stands there with a steering with a rudder at the back and he just turns it and the ship goes where he wants it to go even though there's strong winds he just turns it a bit more you know and he steers it wherever he wants it to go and in the same way that's how our tongue says the bible steers our life so if you confess the wrong things, if you speak the wrong things, if you apply the wrong things in your life, you are steering your life in the wrong direction. So therefore you need to apply your, the right things in your life. Your confession must be the Word of God. Your confession through the blood of the Lamb and by the words of your confession, you will overcome the enemy. So we overcome him by what we speak, what we say. Um, even salvation comes through speaking. Amen? Even salvation is something that you say. It's not just something, that's how you apply forgiveness and salvation to your life by speaking it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to 10, and I'm reading in the ESV, it says, because of because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So with your heart you believe it. You must believe it in your heart, but you must say it. You see what the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And you must believe in your heart that Jesus died and that He rose again. You must believe in your heart that, uh, that He died for your sins, that He gave His life for you. You must believe that. But the way you show that you believe that, the way you apply that blood, the way you apply that is by confessing. Amen? I'm reading it again. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, so you must confess that Jesus is Lord. You make Him the High Priest. 
You confess Him into office. You speak Him into office. That is the, uh, uh, as I say in the beginning, that's, uh, that's how you, you, you your terms of, of, of covenant, you know, you profess Him, you make Him Lord. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you must say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. You are the ruler, the high priest, the apostle, the king, the one that's in charge of my life. I give you my life. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. He says, your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So that is what you must believe. And then now to apply verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified. You can believe all you want, but if you don't say it, it's not finished. Amen. You must believe it and you must say it. Believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You say it when you confess it, when you speak it. You see, because that is, you say it so that the enemy can hear it. So that the devil can hear it. That I am a child of God. I believe that He is the Son of God. I believe He died on the cross. Because you give with your words, you give God rightful place. You give Him uh, uh, the the, 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 the authority to act on your behalf. That's when the Bible says, uh, uh, in the power of the tongue is life and death. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You bind it with your words. You loose it with your words. So you give God right when you speak to act on your behalf. When you call Him Lord, you make Him Lord. And He takes authority and He becomes Lord over your life and Lord over everything. So the enemy's authority is taken away. The enemy's say in your life is being defeated because he's the God of this earth, says the Bible. He's the God of the world. But we are not of this world. We are not under this world. We're not under the rulership of this world because we are in Christ Jesus. We are from another kingdom. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Amen. And therefore, His dominion in the world does not affect us. He does not reign over us. He does not rule over us. He doesn't have a right over us. He doesn't have say over us. Amen. And that is so powerful when you say it. You give God. You say, you are the Lord of my life. You are my king. You are my high priest. The high priest of my confession. The apostle of my confession. I will say that you are the Lord. Amen. Yes. And then I just want to look quickly. Okay, no. I think I'm going to finish here. Um, I just want to read one more scripture. Psalms 107 verse 2. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who, has, who he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Psalms 107 verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You see, you must say, I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been bought back. That's what redemption means. I'm going to start with that next week. But you must say it. You must declare it. You must speak it. Wherever the enemy comes, wherever, where there's sickness in your body, you must say, sickness, I bind you in Jesus' name. I've got this shoulder, you know. And you must just lay your hands. The Bible says you will lay your hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Lord, your word says, I will lay my hands on the sick and they shall recover. Therefore, I lay my hands on the sick and they shall recover in Jesus' name. You know, that's how you apply the blood. That is how you appropriate the blood. That is how you make the blood of Jesus work for you by speaking it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You must say, I am redeemed. I can finish that quickly. You know, redeemed means to buy back. And you have been bought back by the blood of the Lamb. You know, King, uh, there was a man, Uzziah, prophet. In the Bible, and, and the Bible talks about how he, he, the Lord said, God said to him that he must marry this prostitute. And he went and he married this prostitute, and, and uh, Omar. And, and as he prophesied and spoke to the people in the town and spoke to the people, the nation, he prophesied over them. His own wife was a prostitute and going and sleeping with other men and getting money and stuff like that. Because he was very poor as the story goes. He struggled because he was preaching and he was prophesying 
and he was prophesying a lot of doom and gloom and they must repent because they were serving false gods and all those things and so he didn't prosper that well because the people don't like him that much and then his wife went and she was a harlot and eventually the whole story goes that uh, eventually she um, uh, she sold as a slave and she's on the slave market she's on the slave market and here comes Osea, and he, he, everyone says to him, leave her, don't let her go, she's, she's a harlot, she's this, she's that. And eventually he goes and he buys her back from the slave market. They were going to buy her as a slave for one barley of wheat, you know, next to nothing. And he comes and he says, now I will give you 15 pieces of silver for her. And he buys her back. With all he had, he buys her back. And that's the whole story. The whole story is about how Jesus bore, how God bought us back with his son, giving his own son, paying the price. And though we were not worth it, though we were sin, we were filthy, we, we were harlots, harlots in that sense of that they were serving other gods, God still came and he bought them back. And that was the nicest, the best story of redemption, you know. And so we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 1 Peter 1 verse 18 to 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with the corruptible things like silver or gold, it says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You've been bought back. You see, and that's what you must say. We must make a confession sometimes of what God has done. Let's do a confession. Um, just do one for, for that. So say after me, say, through the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus I, have been redeemed I have been redeemed out of the hands of the devil. Out of the hands of the devil. Through the blood of Jesus, I have been redeemed out of the hands of the devil. You speak it. That's how you apply the blood. Through the blood of Jesus, I have been redeemed from the hands of the devil. Amen. You've been brought back out of the hands of the devil. And you must say, whenever the enemy comes, when things are going bad, when your business is going down, when things are looking like it's not going to work out, you must say, you must declare, you must speak. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Out of the hands of the enemy. Out of the hands of the devil. He has no right, no authority. And in Georgia, you must speak it over your daughter. You know, she has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Satan, you have no right, no authority, no place in her life. She has been bought back. And she will live. And she will be blessed. And she will come into the fullness of what God has for her. Amen. Can you see that? That's how you must apply the finished work of Christ in your life by speaking. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you this morning. And Father, I just want to pray for everyone that's here this morning. Father, help us to catch this truth this morning. And that we will start applying your blood in our lives, Father. By speaking what Christ has done. Us. That we will speak. That we will overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimony. And Father, we this morning we come and apply your blood over this church. Father, we thank you that this church... The latter will be greater than the former. Father, we thank you that we will see people come to this place. We will see this church grow, Father, so that we can go out and reach the lost, Father. So that we can do evangelism, so that we can do the things you've called us to do, Father. So that children can be trained up, so that Bible schools can be planted, Father. So that things can come into the fullness and the purpose and the plan. Why you set the church there, Father? We can have home groups and stuff where this church will expand and grow, Father because I believe in the end times Lord you want to increase your kingdom will know no end and your glory shall know no bounds Father the church should increase and should grow and we should fill the earth we should fill this place Father because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Father that is part of our commission to go out there and get people to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and as we declare and as we speak and as we speak that Jesus Christ is Lord as every knee bows and say Jesus Christ is Lord Father we are expanding your Lordship 
over this earth. We are expanding your Lordship over this country. We are expanding your Lordship, Father, in business, in every area. And Father, we want to see you being Lord of all. Although you already are, we have to speak it. We have to declare it. We have to enforce it. We are your people, Father. And Lord, we thank you that you will help us to understand the purpose of our calling in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Oh, Rabba, Rabba, Shaka.